The countdown to election day is on. Just 20 days until voters across Alabama head to the polls. Tonight we're getting a closer look at the candidates and some of the big issues. First up, the race for Alabama's top office. Incumbent Republican Governor Kay Ivey is running for her first full term, facing a challenge from Tuscaloosa Mayor Walt Maddox, the Democratic nominee. We invited both for an on-camera interview. Mayor Maddox agreed, but a representative from the governor's office told us Ivy was unavailable for a sit-down interview. So tonight, you'll hear from Mayor Maddox. First step, improving infrastructure. Mayor Maddox says it starts with passing the Alliance for Alabama's Infrastructure Plan and getting funding to local governments for much-needed projects. If we do not improve our roads and bridges, we're going to cut communities off from their future. This problem has been kicked down the road for over 30 years in Montgomery with the same with 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 my opponent being part of that Montgomery machine. Um, it's time that we have new leadership that's focused on moving Alabama forward. Mayor Maddox says moving our state forward also means improving education. He wants to pass a lottery and estimates it would bring in $300 million a year. That money would fund public education priorities like universal pre-K, college scholarship programs, and workforce development. I asked the mayor how he responded to critics who questioned whether this is a long-term viable revenue option. I'm pragmatic in my leadership. This is the best option we have right now to change Alabama from being at or near the bottom in everything that matters. I'm running for governor not to continue the status quo. I'm running for governor so we can have a dynamic shift in our thinking and our outcomes in this state. The lottery is our best and quickest option to achieve that. Mayor Maddox believes money from the state lottery could also be used to help fund more school resource officers on campus all around the state, something he sees as key to improving school security. What he does not want to see, arming teachers or administrators. And it's wrong of the leaders of our state to sell this as a way that's going to make our children feel safe when they go to school. They know it won't work. We've got to stop playing on emotions and fear in this state. Our leaders should come up with concrete solutions like ours, hardening the facilities, ensuring every school has an SRO or a certified law enforcement officer in the building, closing the gap between mental health and ALEA. Those are the ways that we can make our schools safer. I also asked the mayor about health care and how to improve access to it, especially in rural areas. Day one, in hour one, we expand Medicaid through an executive order. And then we begin working with the legislature to expand Medicaid overall in our state. Because if we do not do this, you will see probably a dozen more rural hospitals close over the next two years. You're actually going to begin to see the collapsing of our urban health care uh, opportunities in the state. Recently, Morgan County just lost its OBGYN service. One of the most populous counties in this state now has lost a critical type of health care they need for their, for their community. We have to expand Medicaid day one. And for our leaders to intentionally not do this, and let me underline intentionally, they knew what would happen. Another issue the next governor will face is dealing with the state trooper shortage we see in Alabama. Mayor Maddox says his funding plan includes immediately hiring more state troopers in the state and improving their resources. In terms of paying for it, we have uh, proposed uh, throughout this campaign that we we go after sports gambling, which the Supreme Court now has given the states the ability to do that. That we reach a compact with the Porch Creek Indian and we figure out how to tax the existing gambling that is already in Alabama. Uh, this issue has been debated for way too long, and we know between the lottery and sports gaming and existing gambling that's already in our state, there's almost a half a billion dollars that can be captured for education and general fund services without raising taxes. I think that's a pretty good place to start. That was just a piece of our conversation. We touched on a number of other issues, including election security and improving workforce development in the state. You can see much more of that interview on WVTM13.com and the WVTM13 app. And as for Governor Ivey, she may not debate her opponent, but she has a name well known here in Alabama and a long list of accomplishments from her years of public service. I, K, I, D. She finally swear. She finally swear. Governor Kay Ivey is the second woman to serve as Alabama's governor, taking over after Robert Bentley's resignation. And she'll go down in the history books. Ivey was the first Republican woman elected lieutenant governor of Alabama and was also the first Republican to hold that office for two straight terms. She has plenty of experience under her belt. Before that, she served two terms as state treasurer. Ivey grew up in the small town of Camden, Alabama, and worked on the family farm. After graduating from Auburn University, she was a bank officer and a high school teacher. Since taking office, she's used her background to make education a priority and has also put an emphasis on infrastructure and creating jobs. After nearly a year consumed with scandals surrounding Robert Bentley, Governor Ivey prides herself in restoring the political climate and trust in the state's government. 
And when you go to the polls in 20 days, you'll see four amendments on the ballots. The first is about the Ten Commandments. Sherry Falk takes a closer look at what a vote for this amendment means. This is one of the more controversial amendments on the ballot. Some feel it's a matter of the separation of church and state. For others, this decision will be about religious freedom. The big issue here is the Ten Commandments. Voting yes means the commandments can be displayed on public property, such as schools and courts, if it meets constitutional requirements, like being displayed alongside other historical and educational documents. The amendment adds language to the Constitution about people's rights to worship, saying a person is free to worship God as he or she decides. And it would also say a person's religious beliefs will have no effect on their civil or political rights. Finally, no public funds could be used to defend the law if it's challenged in court. Now to one of the congressional races in Alabama, District 6. So this stretches from north of Bluntsville, south past Clanton, and includes areas like Gardendale, parts of Hoover and Vestavia, Chelsea and Alabaster. The race features incumbent Republican Congressman Gary Palmer and Democratic nominee Danner Klein. I talk with them both about border security and immigration. What we mean when we talk about a border wall, that's a combination of physical uh, and, and uh, technical. Uh, uh, using air stats, for instance, or drones uh, to use the technology to, to look into uh, across the border to see who's, who's staging to come across. Uh, but we've also got to hire more Border Patrol agents and they need to be forward deployed. Congressman Palmer says this is not an overnight project and the cost will be spread out over time in terms of a path to legal citizenship for those currently in the United States. I think we can we can work that out. I think most people agree that uh, if they've been here and they've, uh, they've held stable jobs that there ought to be a, a legal pathway for them to come, but it cannot be without some form of restitution. Uh, we have the rule of law for a reason. The law has to apply equally to everyone. His opponent, Democrat Danner Klein, says lawmakers need to work together and come up with comprehensive immigration reform. He says there needs to be compromise on this issue, noting that securing the border with additional funding, structures, and personnel can come with allowing a path to legal status. I asked him what that looked like, and he pointed to the framework used in the past on this issue. Identify them. They may pay some back taxes. They may pay a penalty. But at the end of the day, the important point is that's 11 million people that are contributing to our economy. And if you were to do what some folks want to do and just deport all 11 million, that would destroy certain portions of the economy in this country. We can't do that. There's no practical way to do it. It's, it's, uh, it's cruel and it, it makes no sense. We need to find a way to make them legal and increase their ability to contribute meaningfully to our, our society. In terms of the border wall, Klein says there are other ways to explore improving security. Uh, no, I do not see that as a key piece. I think there are much more cost effective ways to handle that issue and just spending billions and billions of dollars on a wall is not going to, to keep this country safe. That's a fantasy. We had a special Senate election back in December, then both primary and general local elections across the state this year and the primaries for the midterm. So it seems like we've gone to the polls quite a bit lately. Yeah, and all that voting could have an effect on turnout this election day. Lisa Crane finds out how. Well, we have heard a lot leading up to the midterms about voter fatigue, and I'm here with Marissa Grayson, a political science professor at Stanford University. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. As always, we love having you here. Uh, let's talk about voter fatigue. Just tell us what it is. So the idea of, of voter fatigue is this idea of voter apathy. So people not being energized to show up to vote. Sometimes it's caused by the amount of elections that we have and other times people just not feeling a connection. So we see less people turn out, for example, in midterm races. And some of that comes from voter fatigue. Do you think it's going to have an impact this time around? I think it may. I think we're seeing um, those who identify with parties and are really part of the base, base being energized. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we have a lot of people who are undecided or independent, and there might not be something that brings them out to vote that day. So those people right in the middle may not just feel connected to either side. Either in the middle, um, like they don't identify with a party or they're low information voters. They're just not really paying attention. And unless there's something that really catches their attention, they're not going to go to the efforts of voting. And who might that help this time around, do you think? 
Well, I think it depends on the state. Here in Alabama, it probably um, will help Republicans. So in general, we know that Republicans turn out for midterm elections more. We're seeing in some of the other states that Democratic energy is, is actually high. And with primary races, we saw more Democrats turn out. But in Alabama, without many heated races, it probably helps Republicans. When you have a lot of um, high profile uh, political going on like the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, does that motivate more people or does it turn people off? I think it motivates some people. So um, I think it, it's the people who really are energized about the issue. And we're seeing it with both Democrats and Republicans. Um, so after, uh, after the hearings, for example, 29% of people, of women said, that um, Kavanaugh should not be confirmed, but 70% of Republican women said they should. And so I think we'll see a good bit of Republican women who come out partly because of that issue. All right, we'll talk more about that in a little bit too. Marissa Grayson, okay. thank you so Great. much. We're still ahead, election security, how elections in our state may have been compromised. Also, we're gonna go to a polling place to show you exactly what you'll face on November 6th. Um, what was your first job? Uh, bag boy at Bruno's. Uh, first car? Uh, El Camino. Favorite food? Fried chicken. Favorite ice cream? Uh, peanut butter. What's on your pizza? Uh, chicken and cheese. Sweet or unsweet tea? Unsweet. Favorite music or band? Uh, Black Crows. Favorite TV show? Modern Family. Favorite social media app? Twitter. Beach or mountains? Beach. Auburn or Alabama? UAB. Dog or cat? <laughs> Dog. And uh, your role model growing up? Oh, Winston Churchill. What was your first job? I was a bag boy uh, at an IGA grocery store. Uh, what was your first car? It was a Renault Le Car 1978 that I paid $500 for. Favorite food? Uh, barbecue. Favorite ice cream flavor? Chocolate chip. What's on your pizza? Pepperoni. Sweet or unsweet tea? Uh, unsweet now. Um, favorite music or band? Uh, contemporary Christian music. Favorite TV show? You know, I don't know that I have one. Uh, how about we just simply say I'm, I'm a follower of the news. Uh, favorite social media app? Uh, I use Twitter. Uh, beach or mountains? Mountains. Auburn or Alabama? Uh, Alabama because I was named after the quarterback at Alabama when I was born. Uh, dog or cat? Uh, dog, definitely. And uh, your role model growing up? Uh, you know, Hank Aaron was my hero as a kid. I thought he was a remarkable human being and a remarkable athlete. Well, we're counting down to Election Day, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse says Alabama has one of the highest prescribing rates of opioids in the nation. Yeah, so fighting this problem will be a top issue for the next Attorney General. The two candidates running for that office are incumbent Steve Marshall, who was appointed by then-Governor Robert Bentley last year, and Democratic nominee Joe Siegelman. I sat down with both to get their takes on addressing the opioid epidemic. Our responsibility now is we've done the planning, we need to do the implementation. And we've seen some progress there, whether it be some changes in the law, the investment in our prescription drug monitoring database to give physicians and pharmacists more information. Uh, and now we've got to be able to do a better job at data collection so that we can not only continue to look at how we are in the situation we're in now, but whether or not the recommendations being implemented are making a difference going forward. And so I'm very encouraged compared to where I was a year ago. I believe that there's hope, but there's also a lot of work to do. Attorney General Marshall also added his office is working to develop more community drug coalitions to address this issue with young people and add more take back programs with pharmacies to make sure drugs are disposed of properly. I also asked him about his personal connection to this fight following the death of his wife who struggled with depression and opioids. My family was simply impacted as a result of my wife's condition with chronic health problems as well as suffering from mental illness. So I've firsthand witnessed the, the issues that can take place and have taken place with families throughout Alabama and have very much empathy for what it is uh, that they're seeing and they're attempting to do. Marshall's opponent, Democratic nominee Joe Siegelman, called this one of the biggest and toughest challenges the state faces and says you have to approach this as a public health crisis. We've got to make sure that we aren't warehousing individuals, um, both with mental illness and drug addiction. Uh, we need to make use of diversion programs to make sure that people get the help that they need so that it not only helps them and helps their families, but it helps all of us because then tax dollars aren't having to shoulder the burden for some of these people and we give them the best opportunity 
to be productive and contributing citizens. Tonight, we've been taking a closer look at the four amendments. It will be on every ballot in the state of Alabama on Election Day. Guy Rawlings breaks down Amendment 2, which focuses on abortion and explains what voting yes would mean. Statewide Amendment 2 has to do with personhood or abortion. A voting yes on the amendment means you're in favor of adding language to the state constitution protecting the rights of unborn children. It declares that it's the public policy of Alabama to recognize and support the sanctity of unborn life and the right to life of unborn children. The amendment would also specify that the Constitution of Alabama does not protect the right to abortion or the funding of it. So if this amendment passes, nothing in the state constitution could be used to argue for a right to abortion if Roe v. Wade is ever overturned. A new study shows eight in 10 Americans are concerned about potential hacking in the election process. And it appears those fears are well founded. As Lisa Crane tells us, election security groups are sounding the alarm about email and internet voting. Most Alabama voters cast their ballot in a very old fashioned and low tech way. They head out to the polls on election day and use paper ballots. A small number vote by absentee ballot. Members of the military, though, deployed overseas, use an online portal. And that's the method that has the group Common Cause worried. Over 100,000 ballots were returned via the Internet in the 2016 election. And for years we have known that ballots sent over the Internet can be intercepted and changed or deleted and that is a major concern. 32 states, including Alabama, use some type of email or internet-based voting. Of those 100,000 votes in 2016, just over 1,000 came from Alabamians. We don't know if any ballots have been changed. We will never know if the ballots have been changed, and that's just the problem here. Federal officials say Russia targeted election systems in 21 states leading up to the 2016 presidential election, and Alabama was one of those states. While they were unsuccessful here in our state, security experts say it wasn't for a lack of trying. They say paper voting is right now the only secure way to vote. Lisa Crane, WVTM 13. Alabama Secretary of State John Merrill says the fact that hackers were not able to penetrate our system in 2016 shows the ongoing effort to secure the integrity of Alabama elections has been successful. Well, coming up, the candidates for Secretary of State tell us how they plan to ensure elections in Alabama are secure. And we'll check out a sample ballot to prepare you before you head to the polls. For these uh, first questions, what was your first job? My first job, I worked uh, in a library. How about our uh, first car? First car was actually the car that I still have today which is uh, a Chevy Avalanche with more than 300,000 miles on it. Um, I love that truck and um, it, is, uh, it has served me well thus far. Uh, favorite food? Probably dessert. Favorite ice cream? Coffee. What's on your pizza? Uh, pizza, uh, I'm a barbecue chicken guy. How about uh, sweet or unsweet tea? Sweet tea. Uh, favorite music or band? Uh, my, my girlfriend is the music of, of our relationship. She's the one who provides my music, and so I listen to whatever she, whatever she puts on. I, could, I don't even know that I can tell you. Uh, how about favorite TV show? Um, I don't really watch TV. How about your show? <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite social media app? Social media, I am awful at. How about uh, Beach or Mountains? Probably beach. Auburn or Alabama? I went to undergrad and law school at the University of Alabama, and so I can't hide it. I'm a Crimson Tide guy. How about dog or cat? Dog. And a role model growing up? Mm, probably my parents. You know, they, um, they instilled in me the importance of committing yourself to public service. What was your first job? Oh, I worked at a pharmacy. First car? A Toyota Camry. Favorite food? Hummus. Favorite ice cream? <laughs> Sorbet. What is on your pizza? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Sweet or unsweet tea? 
I grew up in Alabama. Is there anything called on sweet tea? Of course it's sweet tea. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite music or band? That is a loaded question. I am from Birmingham, Alabama, where there are too many to name, but uh, I enjoy all kinds of bands, but I prefer the ones who are local. Okay. Favorite TV show? Friends. Favorite social media app? Twitter. Beach or mountains? Oh, by far the mountains. Auburn or Alabama? War Eagle. Dog or cat? Dogs. And uh, who's your role model growing up? Uh, my mother. She is just an amazing human being, and I've never seen anyone who can work as hard as she does. And now as a grandmother, she has more energy in her small finger than I do in my entire body. So I always tell people if I can ever get to her age with as much energy as she has, I will have lived a very successful life. As we count down to Election Day, election security remains front and center as we head toward the midterms. Yeah, this is one of the most important issues the Secretary of State must focus on. The candidates in this election are incumbent John Merrill and Democratic nominee Heather Milo. We begin with Secretary of State John Merrill. I asked him how the more than $6 million the federal government gave Alabama to help secure the elections should be spent. When you talk about specifics, one of the things that we want to do is to protect the integrity and the credibility of the process, but that could mean purchasing electronic poll books. It could mean upgrading the election system, upgrading the election equipment, making sure that our voter registration equipment is where it needs to be and that the, the files and that the network that's in place has all the security mechanisms that need to be there. I asked Secretary Merrill if he wants more federal help with securing the election process and he told me he is open to additional assistance from public and private partners when it's available. In terms of what more needs to be done, well, the main thing that we need to do is to continue to have strong partnerships with our public and private partners because they introduce new things to us, not just technology and not just equipment to be purchased, but new ideas and concepts about things we need to be focused on, things that they are seeing in other states, things that we have seen in other states that we want to talk to them about how they're being implemented and what we can do in the state of Alabama. His opponent, Heather Milam, says she's open to asking the federal government for more financial assistance to protect our state's voter systems from hackers. She says that money from the federal government should go towards securing Alabama's voter files. This is something that we must take very seriously. It is an attack on uh, our democracy. And so whatever help that we can get from the federal government, we need to look at and take into consideration and use effectively. But it also takes working with local governments. We are working with 67 different counties here in the state of Alabama. And we need all of them working diligently and educated on the process and also understanding how to use the technology that we have implemented in, the, in recent years. I also asked her if after that more than $6 million is spent, does more still need to be done to protect our election systems? I think that that is a very complicated question because there's going to be information that I'll only know once I get into office. And so I want to be prepared and open-minded about it. I want to be fully ready for the um, complications that might face our, that currently face our state and might continue to face our state. Because what we know is that we are continuing to be uh, attacked for lack of better words, we really are. And it's something that uh, is, has not slowed down. They're doing it through multiple digital channels and it will be incumbent on me as the Secretary of State to make sure that I'm doing everything uh, that I possibly can as a leader in that organization, the arbiter of the election systems, to make sure we are securing not only the election systems themselves, but making sure that the integrity of every vote is secure.